politicians have of slavery at this time. First, slavery preserves and even promotes the qualities associated with the undeserving poor. <coughs> Secondly, abolition necessarily requires the instruction of the slave in the qualities of the deserving poor, industriousness, prudence, patriarchy. All these make for orderly independence, orderly independence. While thirdly, self-authored freedom of the enslaved would, absent of proper instruction, threaten to unleash a mass of indolence, licentiousness and anarchy. In actual fact, that is the thing which is behind the whole classical political economy, from Adam Smith to James Stewart to Adam Ferguson. While the slave trade is abolished in 1807, then come two commissions whose work is intimately influenced by each other. The 1832 Select Committee on the Extinction of Slavery and the 1834 Royal Commission on the Poor Laws. Debates over the extinction of slavery consider the degree to which a freed black populace might evolve from their savage state and take on the deserving attributes of the thrifty, industrious, free labourer. Meanwhile, the Commission on the Poor Law seeks to make the provision of relief even harsher for the English poor by placing all those who call upon the relief in brutal workhouses away from their kith and kin. The Commissioner's report argues that poor relief, as it is, is given too easily and so breeds undeserving attributes. If the poor receive the relief too easily, they become idle, dependent, bad-mannered, bad parents, fathers especially, nothing's changed. But here's the thing. The report is full of analogies. As the English poor become dependent on relief, they become blackened. Take, for instance, the opinion of one Robert Bevan, magistrate of Bury St. Edmunds, writing in the report. He describes the quintessential rural labourer as a mean, discontented slave ready to cut his master's throat. Such analogies litter the report. And they explicitly reference the contemporaneous Caribbean. Here's how the commissioners themselves make their main argument. The constant war which the pauper has to wage with all who employ or pay him is destructive to his honesty and his temper. As his subsistence does not depend on his exertions, he loses all that sweetens labour, its association with reward, and gets through his work such as it is with the reluctance of a slave. There's many more examples of this, but the point I'm trying to convey is that the deserving, undeserving distinction in England at this point is racialised. The undeserving English poor, their slave analogues, they've been blackened. Not slaves, not black, but blackened, yet to become white. Their undeserving nature makes them blackened. And for that, they'll have to be punished and sanctioned. So I want to move now to the era of supposed emancipation. How does the fact of legal emancipation change the association of blackness with the undeserving poor? Well, firstly, the Negro is now considered widely to be at least basically human. Secondly, though, an opposition to such claims of racial equality persists, and most famously in the politics of Thomas Carlyle. Carlyle complains that the Negro does not have the rationality to abide by the laws of supply and demand, and so making him free has assured ruin for the colonial economy. Emancipation will result, he says, in black anarchy and social death for the white race. Carlyle fantasises over the products of miscegenation between black and white, unnameable abortions and white coiled monstrosities. Thirdly, even those who espouse racial equality are still committed to the idea of civilizational hierarchy. So if equally human, still, the Negro is a child who has to be trained into humanity by the white Christian family. And that family angle is really important because empire is conceived as a family. 
So the equality of the Negro is always qualified by hierarchy, paternalism and blackness as a deficiency. The ideal of empire as a family is therefore unavoidably fragile and it's broken by the 1865 Morant Bay uprising in Jamaica. In response to impoverishment, a lack of land redistribution and minority white rule, black Baptists dare to rebel against the abolitionist father. They're brutally repressed by the governor, Edward Eyre. He justifies mass executions by reference to the undeserving attributes of Jamaica's populace, who, even after emancipation, have retained for Eyre a natural disposition to indolence and inactivity. Same way, the Times newspaper in Britain attributes the cause of the uprising to agitators from Haiti who had broken out the nature of Africa hitherto dormant in the lazy Jamaican. But the Times also characterises Jamaica as our pet institution and its inhabitants, our spoiled children. Now remember, the idea of family is crucial. And remember, the equality of the Negro is qualified by being a junior adopted member of the white family. And remember too, as I've noted with Carlisle, the problem of miscegenation is always present. Now, responsibility for the uprising is placed upon two key persons. The Black Baptist deacon named Paul Bogle and a former member of the House of Assembly and fellow Black Baptist called George William Gordon. Aya ensures that both are executed, but Gordon, not Bogle, but Gordon, he has a black mother and a white father. He's forcibly removed by Aya from Kingston, an area not under martial law, to Morant Bay under martial law, there to be executed. And in England, it's Gordon's, not Bogle's fate, Gordon's fate that splits public and political opinion. Supporters of Gordon, such as famous philosopher John Stuart Mill, charge Ayer, the governor, with the illegal execution of a British subject and call for the obligation of justice and humanity towards all races beneath the Queen's sway. Supporters of Ayer, such as famous physicist John Tyndall, say, we do not hold an Englishman and a Negro to be convertible terms, nor do we think that the cause of human liberty will be promoted by any attempt to make them so. So implicit in the debate over Morant Bay is a re-racialisation of the distinction between deserving and undeserving poor. Can mulatto men ever escape the undeserving traits of their black origins? Or do they remain too tainted with black anarchy? Well, Aya is not tried for the murder. And so the answer is that blackness is an undeserving trait that can't be removed and that justifies extrajudicial treatment. In fact, even though Jamaica is technically considered a separate colony at the time, it then reverts to being a crown colony, while other white settler colonies, such as Australia and New Zealand, continue on their path towards self-rule. But there's something else going on at the same time. As Morant Bay is being discussed in the halls of Parliament, so too is the Reform Bill of 1867 extending the franchise to the skilled and settled worker in Britain who displays deserving attributes, is a patriarch and enjoys a permanent residence. The franchise does not, though, incorporate a white working class, but rather extends a racialised family. Here's opposition leader William Gladstone who welcomes this new constituency made by the franchise as our fellow subjects, our fellow Christians, our own flesh and blood. Benjamin Disraeli from the other side, meanwhile, counts upon the English tradition of paternalistic deference so that England remains, in his words, safe in the race of men in inhabit, who inhabit her and safe in her national character, in her fame, in the traditions of a thousand years. So let's run these two events together, Morant Bay and the Reform Act, alongside each other, as the historian Catherine Hall first did so over 20 years ago. The imperial family now becomes racialised as white 
Remember, after abolition, empire as a family had a dubious or fragile incorporation of the newly emancipated black children. But now, the imperial family becomes re-racialised as purely white, or in the parlance of the time, Anglo-Saxon. The deserving of the English working class, the men that is, become members of this family. They don't become their own class, they become members of this family because they're exemplars of orderly independence. Meanwhile, from being considered part of the imperial family, even if only junior members, the black poor are cast out. No longer family, they're simply undeserving colonial subjects who must be patiently, scientifically developed someday perhaps. If you do development studies in the British Empire, this is the moment where development, the, develop, the, the subject of development appears. The Anglo-Saxon family and non-white subjects, these are now the main and distinct constituencies of British Empire. 